Well, good evening and welcome to our March 3rd, 2015 Ogden City Council work session. Uh, we'd like to recognize a few people in our audience today. We have uh, Travis Campbell from uh, Congressman Bishop's office. And I don't know where you went, there he is. And uh, we do have our uh, several members of our planning commission, as well as former council member Susie Van Hoosier. Welcome to, uh, to this meeting. Appreciate you being here. Um, as well as, as our partners in the college town partnership, uh, the debaters from Weaver State and uh, led by Dr. Guevara. We appreciate them being here as well. So we'll turn this time to Dr. Guevara and, and uh, let him do some introductions of those who will be presenting to us tonight. Thank you. It's uh, nice to see everyone again. Thank you for the invitation to come and uh, have a debate on this uh, important topic of short-term vacation rentals. Uh, tonight, we're using a different format than the format we used uh, last time. We'll be using a Lincoln-Douglas format, which is a one-on-one -on -one debate rather than a team-based debate. And we have two of our older students uh, who will be representing uh, both sides of the proposition. Uh, the, the resolution is that, uh, the, uh, that the Ogden City Council should substantially uh, prohibit short-term vacation rentals. And on the affirmative, I have, uh, we have Catherine Shackelford, who is a uh, junior in uh, s secondary education and uh, a former team co-captain of the squad. She is also our uh, very, our, our expert actually on Lincoln Douglas debating and she will affirm the resolution that the city, uh, the Ogden City Council should substantially regulate short-term vacation rentals. She will be coached by Weber State Debate Team's assistant coach, Mr. Blake Marsh, who is also a graduate of the Department of Communication and uh, actively involved in our program. Uh, the negative team, or actually the negative debater, will be Miss uh, Bianca Morales, who is a double major in uh, both French and in philosophy. Uh, she is a junior on the team and uh, has been named next year's co-captain. She will be coached by Miss Lindsay uh, Van Loveny, who is one of our uh, uh, coaches on the uh, Weber State Debate Team coaching staff. And uh, we've been uh, working on this project uh, uh, in between our, our travels on the, uh, on the regional and national circuit as we prepare for, for nationals. But uh, I was particularly thrilled that uh, these volunteers stepped forward in order to uh, provide for this evening's debate. Uh, we are ready to begin when I am given the, the, the signal to do so. Wonderful. Okay, then uh, Ms. Catherine Shackelford will start the debate uh, and represent the uh, affirmative side of the resolution. Ms. Shackelford? Hello there. Oh. I would first like to thank the council for giving us the opportunity to use our debate skills here in the real world. It's a real pleasure to be here. Tonight I will be arguing an affirmation of the resolution that the Ogden City Council should substantially prohibit short-term vacation rentals. Contention one is that short-term vacation rentals increase crime. Short-term vacation rental companies have lax requirements that make it easy for hosts to create fake identities. Jessica Pressler from the New York Magazine in 2014 writes, Rolf knows subletting a rent-controlled apartment is illegal, but he doesn't feel any moral qualms about it. I have fake names, fake address, also my photo, he says. I search the internet and use an image of, like, a young sporty guy. They're incentivizing taking a whole class of apartments off the market, and I don't see the upside of giving it up an entire class of residential apartment buildings so that a couple of guys can become billionaires. And one victim came home to his pillage department that was functionally turned into a meth house. Michael Arrington from TetchCrunch.com reports a victims of Airbnb's story in 2011. Troy Dayton's Oakland home was rented by a meth addict with a stolen identity. Here's Troy's original comment. In addition to valuable stolen, the thieves slash addicts did thousands of dollars of bizarre damage to my rented home and left it littered with meth pipes. They were identity th thieves too, and all of my personal information was strewn about. Further investigation of my own led me to evidence that the people were not just thieves, but were also dangerous. I too feared for my own safety and would not stay at my house for some time. 
Short-term vacation rentals also provide a secure location for prostitutes to operate from. According to Andy Campbell of the Huffington Post in 2014, prostitutes are using the online sharing site to set up tran transient brothels. Escort services have discovered that it's much more cost-effective to rent an Airbnb apartment for one or more weeks than a room at a swanky hotel. Hotels have doormen and cameras, whereas apartments are usually buzz-in. The sex workers book the rooms themselves with their personal Airbnb profiles and then pay with a prepaid debit card. Jessica Pensari says she rented out her place from March 21st to 23rd to a woman who said she was an army soldier who needed a place to crash between assignments. But when a sex worker was stabbed over a price dispute in the West 43rd Street apartment, the police called Pensari. Ari Tiemann rented out his place to a guy who said he'd be staying in the apartment with his family. But when Tiemann returned home early, he found a wild orgy happening in his apartment instead. Contention, too, is that short-term vacation rentals hurt the local economy. Short-term vacation rentals cannot prevent tax evasion and cause a loss of hotel revenues. A study by Boston University School of Management in 2014 concludes that a 1% increase in Airbnb listings in Texas results in a 0.05% decrease in quarterly hotel revenues, and that lower-end hotels and those that don't cater to business travelers were more adversely affected. The sharing economy is significantly changing consumption patterns, as opposed to generating purely incremental activity, as argued in prior work. Studying the case of Airbnb, we identify that its entry into the Texas market has had a quantifiable negative impact on local hotel revenues. And ski towns like Park City have invested in a software program to crack down on illegal short-term vacation rental owners. Reed Armstrong from Summit Daily in 2010 writes, Western mountain towns are moving forward with plans to hunt down illegal vacation rental owners through their online advertisements. Ski towns like these estimate that they may be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales tax revenue through non-compliant owners of short-term rental properties. The Colorado Association of Ski Towns has contracted Virginia-based iStreet Solutions, which has developed a software program that, calls, that crawls the internet in search of vacation rental advertisements. The software program cross-references the information gathered from the internet with existing databases of short-term rental properties. The onus then falls into to the town to enforce their laws. And renting homes to tourists instead of locals cuts down on available housing and drives up the cost of the scarce housing that remains. Jessica Pressler from the New York Magazine in 2014 writes, the property owners all over the city, having realized they can make more money on short-term rentals, have begun converting apartments into full-time Airbnb properties, resulting in their being taken off the market for full-time tenants and the further depletion of the already limited stock of affordable or even relatively affordable housing. The data scrapping company Connotate analyzed Airbnb site and found rent had risen precipitously in the areas with the highest concentration of listings. And rent controlled units are being evicted by landlords to make room for more profitable, profitable vacation rentals. According to scpr.org, a website for a pu California public radio station said last month that landlords have found it more profitable to be in the vacation rental business, so they're using California's Ellis Act to evict tenants in rent controlled units, saying they're going out of business. Then resurrect the building solely for vacation rentals. These de facto hotels are significantly impacted impacting our inventory of affordable housing, which is a crisis in Los Angeles to begin with, and we can't allow it to get any worse. The conversions have pushed middle class residents out and is changing the character of the neighborhoods. Officials in other cities such as San Francisco have raised similar concerns about landlords using the Ellis Act loophole to cut off rent controlled units. Thus I affirm and strongly urge the Ogden City Council to substantially prohibit short term vacation rentals. Come on up, Ms. Morales. Just uh, stand next to Ms. Shackelford. You can speak here okay. if you like. So for my first question is if whenever we decrease, or whenever Airbnb increases by 1% and hotels decrease by 0.05%, why should we be worried that the decrease is happening with hotels and the increase is going to uh, these private owners of homes? Uh, the, in the increase of revenues going to the private home owners is really just them increasing, like the revenues isn't going into the local economy. So that's why like the 0.05% sounds really small, but it is a substantial decrease in the hotel revenue, which our local economy relies on. 
Okay, and uh, you also describe several uh, instances of different crimes that happen. Um, how often or what is the percentage of these instances? I don't have a percentage because a lot of uh, these sites have been reported on blogs or just like on the comments on the websites themselves, but there are other stories uh, more than this one that I could read if you'd like. Okay, um, why wouldn't this be as much of an issue as it is with I guess long-term residential lease agreements, or why is this unique from that issue? I suppose it's not unique, and I suppose the Ogden City Police Department would still have the same um, ways of going about finding criminality in private homes as they would in the rentals. Okay. Um, does any of your evidence suggest that Airbnb uh, directly increased these crimes, or just created a place for them. I think it increases the crime because when it's not their own home, I think that they they seek out these places because they will not be able to be tied to the crimes because they still are anonymous. So once they leave, the, uh, they, well, using the fake identities, they can't be tracked down again. Whereas if it's in their own home, once they're found, then they get punished. Okay, um, and you also describe renters kicking out people who are living in their property um, so they can make more of a profit. Mm -hmm. If Ogden City has a low percentage of renters and more mortgages, uh, why should this be an issue that concerns us here? Oh, it's. Sorry, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, we actually have a lot of uh, renting homes in Ogden City, um, and it's the rent controlled, like the people who are secure in their uh, rented home that are being kicked out. So not just like the students who are just renting houses for a short time, but people who live here and are renting from landlords. Okay, um, has this increased at all, or is just something that existed and has persisted? Uh, what what are you asking than, is increasing? Has it grown? What what is that at it? all? Uh, people being kicked out of their homes so that landlords can sell. My evidence isn't specific to Ogden City, but it is specific to New York City, where people are like living on top of each other, and like they do have like rent-controlled apartment buildings because you know a New York rent goes up a lot. Um, so it it has increased because they are seeing that because Airbnb is growing and it is a more profitable business that it is more. Uh, um, beneficial to them to r kick them out. Okay, all right, that's all my questions. Thank you. Ms. Morales, could you just pull the microphone down a little bit? There you go. Very good. Okay. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so first, I would like to thank Ogden City for inviting Weber State Debate to collaborate on this issue. And I will be arguing that Ogden City Council should instead legalize, regulate, and tax short-term vacation rentals. Uh, the first advantage is the economy. Uh, the Airbnb debate is about making life more affordable by eliminating the need to own a resource in order to utilize it or simply pay for access as need be. It opens up opportunities for smaller individual persons to generate more money and economic activity rather than being reliant on big name hotels or corporations to do it. This expands the market for more exchange and streams the revenues into pockets that will use it for more long term benefits to our local communities and cities. Um, LA's experience with Airbnb have has proven that it can be a symbiotic relationship that helps homeowners afford their mortgages and, av and avoid foreclosures. Uh, the LA Times reported that um, a company spokeswoman said the vast majority of its hosts are here Oh, sorry. Here are full-time residents renting out their place for extra cash. The average host here rents his or her home 59 nights a year, earning just under $8,000, and nearly half of the hosts said they use the proceeds to pay for the rent or mortgage. Additionally, the money that Airbnb um, generates helps tourists save, oh, sorry, that helps tourists save is spent locally, so tourists shop more and they also stay longer. These tax profits could be used to invest in our city and um, community building purposes. Deidre Van Dyke, uh, who was a previous reporter for Time Magazine, states that last year, 54 million visitors generated $58.7 billion in overall economic impact in New York City, producing $7.5 billion in state and local taxes. Airbnb says they contributed to bringing in 416,000 visitors and generating $768 million in economic activity. The company says not only do their visitors stay longer than hotel visitors six nights versus 
four, uh, but they spend $190 more each day, or sorry, during the day. If Air if Airbnb is bringing in money, what's not to like? For one, there, where are the taxes these de facto hotels should be paying? Taxes that help cities fund education, police, roads, sewer systems, and other infrastructure. The top 40 Airbnb hosts in the city grossed $400,000 over the past three years to the tune of $35 million. Airbnb says they're trying to make good on taxes and work with the cities. They're initiating programs like Shared City, and part of the program is Airbnb's commitment to collect the city's 11.5% hotel tax and submit it quarterly. Also, short-term vacation rentals are inevitable. Regulating it will allow for the government to stay competitive as the market grows. Uh, the Economist has reported that what looks like a disruptive new model will probably end up being mixed into existing models and embraced by incumbents, as has often happened before. Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media says such consolidation is inevitable. When new markets come in, they often look more democratizing than they end up becoming. From a person rather than a faceless company will survive. The fact that regulators, tax collectors, and big companies are now sniffing around a model that has been embraced by millions is a measure of its value and growth potential. The concept for short-term vacation rentals has been around for decades and will only continue to grow and become stronger. Rather than trying to suppress this e new economic field, we should embrace it and endorse it. Attempting to snuff out the market will only force it to recede farther into black markets that are worse than the disadvantages of the status quo. Embracing it would also help the city stay up to speed with the technical technological advances of the market um my second contention will be regulation. Uh, first off, horror stories of obscene crimes are anomalies and they rarely happen. Airbnb encourages users to follow guidelines that are meant to protect them. If these incidents do happen, they are quickly resolved. Uh, Deidre Van Dyke also explains these incidents when she says, Airbnb provides the software the, and, sorry, the hosts of 600,000 listings worldwide. While the company doesn't personally inspect the homes, it does ask participants to follow codes of conduct. Bad reviews weed out poor hosts. These are horror stories out there. Guests kicked out in the middle of the night, robbery, and apartments used for prostitution. But judging by the site's passionate following, these tales are outliers and don't deter those seeking a room that can be $100 cheaper and 10 times more interesting than a day's in. The city of Denver is also in the process of uh, creating practical regulations to allow Airbnb to continue. Ogden City should model the key components of their plan. An editorial in the Denver Post argues, if hotels, bed and breakfast, and other accommodations must pay a lodging tax, so should people who rent out their homes for short stays. But city officials should step carefully, making the licensing process too wieldy or expensive or imposing too many regulations won't work. People will just continue to ignore the rules and rent out their primary residences through online sites. An analysis found that more than 2,000 or more than 2,000 online rentals in Portland, Oregon, only 93 or 4.7% had a permit to operate legally. The city's licensing process should be inexpensive and easy to navigate, and it should be simple for the business to remit the 10.75% lodger's tax as well as other sales taxes. Um, on to my opponent's case. All of the evidence in my opponent's, or in my opponent's first contention are only referring to one short-term vacation rental company known as Airbnb, uh, when there are others that exist. E uh, even her first piece of evidence says that in the unhighlighted portion um, that the man who created the fake identity prefers Airbnb over sites with more stringent requirements like VRBO, where one would need to show that he is the manager or the agent and would also have to show the lease. Furthermore, other companies run extensive background checks, strict screening procedures, and encourages clients to be extremely selective. The companies also have the power to remove any listing that uh, perpetrates suspicious behavior with the feedback of the renters. The biggest problem that my opponent's evidence indicates is the owners of the rentals are not present or even nearby should problems occur. With legalization comes better regulation, which can require owners to have greater responsibility in monitoring their rentals. On her second contention, if short-term vacation rentals were legalized and regulated, they would become like independent local hotels that would be taxed in the same way, meaning there would be no net loss of revenue, but rather a democratization of revenue that would spur our local economy. Furthermore, research indicates that hotel rates decrease in places where there are short-term rentals, which spurs tourism, and that helps our economy grow. On the second point of the second contention about the housing market, cross-apply what, what I argued in my case that 
that opening short-term vacation rentals are, um, are some owners' only option to be able to keep up with, expensive house, with the expensive housing market, and it helps them retain their homes. How will companies be able to ensure that taxes are collected from the rentals? In the same way that they have realized that they were not being paid taxes to begin with because they created technology that sort of mined the listings and they were able to see the revenue. All right. Uh, how will the black market emerge when owners still need to publicly advertise their listings? I would compare it similar to how you can buy a lot of illegal drugs on the internet, you know, where there is a demand, then there is going to be a supply. I think whether or not it happens isn't the question, but to what degree. Okay. Uh, and you say that uh, criminality in these rentals is rare, um, but do you have any like evidence to provide like a more statistic as to that supports that claim? Um, I guess not any more evidence than what was in my original case, um, but my, my evidence that I do have states that most of the people who use this are just honest, hardworking people who need a little bit of extra cash. Okay. Uh, what kinds of regulations will be put in place if the short-term vacation rentals are legalized officially? Um, I guess protection types of regulations that would protect both parties involved. Uh, there would also be regulations to make sure that there is I guess, equal, um, equal pay as well as uh, pricing, um, and also yeah. regulations on how people will live in these places. Right, but what kind of protections can they provide? They could make sure that people who are listing places and who have been accused of um, illegal activity can no longer rent out their homes. Okay, um, so say the tenants aren't the ones committing the crimes, mm -hmm. um, but how can the owners of the rentals, like what can they do to secure their tenants from crimes being committed against them? Uh, against the tenants? Yeah, as opposed to like hotels okay. that do have a little bit more security, how can the owners provide that same security? Well, with regulation would come, you know, increase regulation and patrol from the city. So there could be more cops that drive by these places, or there could be more neighbors that are aware of what's going on. So as far as the people who go and are in danger in these strangers' houses, I think there are mechanisms to protect them from the outside. Okay, thank you very much. Just one moment. My opponent is right when she says that short-term vacation rentals help individuals generate more money. In fact, many have already made it a lucrative business, but it is not always the case that it is their only option to be able to afford their home. In reality, many hosts own several rentals and have become illegal hotels. As Jason Caplet of Skiff.com in 2014 writes, the Attorney General and a host of other state and local politicians say many hosts on Airbnb are violating a state law that prohibits short-term rentals. Airbnb responds by claiming that its hosts are largely made up of people renting the home where they live and doing so only occasionally. The company says it's too hard to police user activity and abiding by local laws while as well as restrictions placed on hosts by leases. It is up to individual users. The company does not provide access to details about its hosts, how many listings they have, or occupancy levels. So Skift turned to Connotate, which is a data extraction monitoring firm, and they concluded that 70% of the available inventory is represented by people who only have one listing, while 30% comes from the users who have posted more than one listing. And of course, this is still citing New York as our example. My opponent also says that requiring companies like Airbnb to pay hotel taxes will solve the issue, but it actually only puts the host at risk because it provides evidence of lease violations. Allison Griswold from Business Insider last month writes, City and state lawmakers are also strongly against allowing Airbnb to collect and remit the tax, fearing it would effectively sanction an operation that local regulations make largely unlawful. It legitimizes a business model that at its core is not legitimate, says Helen Rosenthal, a member of the New York City Council. Considers, or let's see, 
Kruger, a New York state senator, also considers Airbnb hotel tax overtures as duplicitous attempts to sidebar uh, bigger issues. This is merely an effort by Airbnb to bolster their image while ignoring local laws they find inconvenient. Paying hotel taxes actually puts the host at risk of eviction by providing evidence of lease violations and does nothing to alleviate an acute shortage of affordable housing that their illegal activity exacerbates. If hosts began officially paying the occupancy tax, it would create a record with the Department of Finance that they had used their residence for a business purpose in violation of their lease. My opponent also claims that tourists prefer short-term vacation rentals because it's cheaper, which means there is no reason why we should assume that they will spend more in our economy if they are trying to vacation on a budget. Plus, the rentals are often in residential areas that are far away from the touristy sites, which means they are looking for different forms of recreation anyway. Furthermore, a black market of vacation rentals is impossible because the hosts will need to advertise their home somehow anyway, and their neighbors will report illegal rentals. And if you go on to Airbnb.com and you type type in Ogden listings and it gives you the names and the addresses of these people so it wouldn't be difficult for law enforcement to find these people and which would make the black market unlikely. And also, uh, neighbor, or neighbors argue that short-term vacation rentals are a violation of their property rights because the renters are annoyances that throw loud parties and take up parking space, for example. So we could also rely on the neighbors to be able to report to the Ogden City Police if people uh, were violating the terms of the short-term vacation rental. On to the arguments that she made against my case. There are countless stories like Dayton's where people have returned to their homes completely trashed, not to mention the stories of hosts themselves who violate the renters who stay there. Remember, people are able to create dozens of fake identities, which means the feedback that customers post on the websites do not solve the problem because they do not hurt the reputation of real people. She says that Airbnb is the only perpetrator of this and that other companies provide a more I like background checks, I guess, but Airbnb is the largest uh, and is the most common uh, company for short-term vacation rentals, like 75%, whereas VBRO is smaller and people don't use those websites. Uh, also, a criminal only needs to not kill somebody or not trash the place the first couple of times to build up a favor favorable reputation of reviews to gain people's trust. On the last point of my first contention, she says that the problem will be solved if the owners monitor the rental from close by, but that means that either A, they are staying on their own, or on someone else's couch, or they are paying lodging for somewhere else, which means they would be able to afford to live somewhere else and it's not to save their homes. Okay, these will be our final rebuttals. Ms. Morales. <clears throat> My opponent brings up many good and reasonable issues that do have to be confronted and dealt with. The area I do not agree with my opponent in is how to approach a solution. In her first contention, Catherine argues that short-term vacation rentals create hubs for crime and different sorts of abuse. The sad truth is that these crimes are inevitable. They will happen regardless of location. None of her evidence indicates that there was an increase in these forms of crime that was directly caused by Airbnb. Because, because short-term vacation rentals are an exploding market, banning it would be a futile effort. Airbnb was created by the people as a way to meet a variety of needs. Government does not have the ability to ban this market, nor should it desire to. Banning it would only lead to these issues of drugs, violence, and de facto hotels to become bigger and worse, with less transparency from the companies. Regulating it would allow... Um, it. Sorry, regulating it would only better the local community, decrease poverty, and expands, expand Ogden's tourism market. Again, let me remind you that Airbnb alone added $768 million in economic activity to New York's tourism revenue by itself. This is $768 million that would have gone into hotel revenues instead of the local economy. In her e economy contention, she states, um, 
that this market has caused a 0.05 uh, revenue decrease for hotels. Um, but for every single one of those 0.05, there was a 1% increase in the Airbnb users. These are private citizens with mortgages and payments who live within the city and their entire lives go to um, help, or sorry, go to participating in the economy here. She also states that short-term vacation rentals increase de facto hotels, but de facto hotels remain one of the smallest percentages of Airbnb users out there. Uh, the vast majority is still simply, they are simply homeowners who rent out their homes, houses, or apartments while they are away. Um, she also argues that um, it puts hosts at risk of eviction because apartment renters will violate lease agreements. Uh, but out of the few percentage of people who do this, some are doing it under full knowledge that what they are doing is illegal, and others are simply misinformed. I would say that regulation and information would be a better alternative to this rather than banning it. She asks how a black market would happen. Uh, well, as my opponent stated herself, people break rules. If this industry is raking in tens of millions of dollars each year, do we really believe that people will simply stop making that much money simply because we say so? It would be better to legitimize a harmless industry that the people want and that has been proven to work. Um, again, people do ignore rules, but by creating regulations, standards, and inspections, we create an incentive to operate through a legitimate business model that will better, better ensure users of their safety. If we create an avenue for people that have a guaranteed safe and pleasant short-term vacation rental experience, they are significantly more likely to operate through a legitimate business model than one, than one that is unregulated and illegal. If more customers are utilizing it legitimately, then they will be attracted to the legal model rather than an underground one that could put them or others in harm's way. In order for this to be effective, though, there has to be a legal and safe alternative. In the end, when comparing the cost of eliminating this market versus the profits that could be made from regulating it, we see that after regulation, Ogden's tourism market will continue to increase profits, help stabilize the economy by helping owners stay in their homes. On the criminality contention, my, my opponent warns of meth houses, prostitution rings, and identity theft. All of these warnings are real dangers, but banning short-term vacation rentals would, would only increase the instances of these things happening because there will be less regulation, less oversight, and less enforcement of these rules. People are, all, people are also much, likely, much less likely to report crimes committed against them if they feel that they themselves will get in trouble. My opponent mentioned a technological device created by Park City that has helped um, track and identify people who are doing this illegally. I would argue that we could use the same technology to help regulate it when it is a uh, legal business. Uh, many of these issues with short-term vacation rentals are simply because the market is brand new. It is still in its early stages. Its exponential growth has suddenly pushed it to the limelight, forcing jurisdictions all over the US to formulate new legislation in an area that they have never dealt with before. Uh, but these are simply growing pains for the market. Uh, cities that have attempted a ban before have quickly backtracked due to the overwhelming majority that is pushing for this, as well as the massive benefits and revenue streams um, that come in almost immediately. Instead of working against the status quo, the Ogden City Council should embrace what would benefit everyone as a whole, the taxation and regulation of short-term vacation rentals. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morales. Ms. Shackelford? The final word for the affirmative. While the idea of rentals is good and has a flurry of idealistic promises, it falls short of the utopian idea presented tonight. The amount of additional burden this puts on the city, like police and on taxpayers' dollars, will never balance from the status quo. The hotel system works and is thriving in this area. There's no need to solve a problem that doesn't exist. And the biggest difference in the mode of providing lodging is commitment to the city and area. Hotels have a brand and a commitment to the city, whereas the short-term renters, they don't have the commitment, whereas like long-term renters, uh, they are the one, like they're also 
using things that taxes go towards, whereas the short-term renters are benefiting things that they're not paying for. Also, hotel revenues are an integral part of our local community and provides you know, countless jobs. And it's preferable that our guests to Ogden stay in hotels as opposed to short-term vacation rentals because they are inspected regularly and have safety regulations which better protect them against crime. My opponent even admitted that the Airbnb companies are not able to go in and inspect each home, which means they'll Put, they could put pictures of homes that aren't even theirs and create fake reviews and that feedback to seem like they are good renters or that they're good rentees. Also, she still doesn't answer my argument that people are being evicted from their homes to make room for owners who want to make a profit on short-term vacation rentals, which reduces the amount of available housing for people who are looking to move to Ogden, which will only hurt our economy further. Also. She uh, states that the um, that providing them or forcing them to pay the hotel tax is good, and that those who are violating their leases, uh, you know, she says that this is a few amount of people. But running a business out of the uh, out of your home is always already going to be a violation of leases, which means that all of them are are, are all of them are going to be. Uh, a, a, let's see prosecuted, I, I suppose, for violating their leases and would be punishable. Um, furthermore, she, she says that if we were to legalize it, this would provide better regulation. However, I'm arguing that if we legitimize and legalize this business, it will only increase the amount of short-term vacation renters there are, which would make uh, oversight all the more difficult, especially when a lot of these companies are run online, which is already a, a treacherous plane to navigate through. Also, even if the um, prostitution and the uh, meth houses is not, does not substantially increase from the amount that's already in the status quo, short-term vacation rentals provide a safe location for them to be able to perform these operations because they are not held accountable, because they are not on the lease. And uh, she still defends Airbnb as, the, as a good site to be able to do these things. She still uses Airbnb and when she references her statistics, which means that fake identities would still be able to be created because we would not be using places like VBRO when Airbnb is already such a larger company to be used. So I strongly urge you to, uh, <laughs> to affirm the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shackelford. Uh, normally at this time, uh, the students would receive a uh, post-round uh, criticism from their judge. Uh, and uh, we wanted to skip on the, the, the formal declaration of winner and loser and, and leave that more of a determination for uh, our audience members to make on their own. Uh, but I did want to uh, just comment that uh, the team found this research project to be uh, rather interesting because it is so close. Sometimes we have to fight about who's affirmative and who's negative, but not with this effort. Uh, the, the students pointed out New York City has prohibited uh, the short-term vacation leases uh, in less than 30 days. Uh, so have other major American cities like San Diego. But then on the other side of the lineup was uh, cities like San Francisco and Denver who have uh, adopted the, the negatives position more or less to, to legalize these transactions but put them through a regulatory scheme. So the students felt that the research was, was very close and that the, the practice debates themselves in preparation for this evening were also pretty close. So um, we wanted to not uh, issue a judgment of necessarily who won or lost, but uh, the students are ready to answer your questions about any of the research that they, that they, that they did. Uh, and uh, that, that would be my recommendation for the remainder of the time. Anybody have questions? Okay. I have some. Why, why don't the two of you come up and we'll fire out at you. <laughs> Good job, by the way. We appreciate yeah, your... I your uh, <laughs> well, I, in, in either one of you, and I, I'm assuming you, you did some research probably on the crime side, do, do any of the... Um, Rentals have insurance that would allow somebody to stay there. So if there was a fire or crime or something that would happen. Uh, yeah, Airbnbs like has a kind of insurance policy where they would be able to compensate you. Uh, but the problem was, or at least like the stories that I read, that Airbnb 
wasn't really responding right away. Like even like their urgent hotline and their urgent emails, uh, they weren't, um, they were uh, really, they tried to negotiate uh, lower terms for compensation, and so they weren't the most reliable, I think, because um, obviously I was F. I don't think they were very reliable in providing compensation uh, for any loss or damage that happened to the homeowners. Well, and I think homeowners insurance eventually will kind of regulate this. It, it's something new. It's something if you call them, they don't have a good answer either. You know, I have a friend who was thinking of doing this um, with the property he owns. Um, in a place where people would want to vacation, and his homeowner's insurance really didn't give him a good answer as far as would it be covered if something happened if you were doing a vacation rental. So I suspect that might be something that they'll deal with in the future. Well, I have a question for you. Um, in, in Ogden, it's, it's, uh, it's already going on, as you're aware, um, but the discussion that has, has uh, kind of brought us to this point is, is where would it be an appropriate use and where wouldn't it be? Um, there are, you know, the residential, single home residential, single family residential, multiple family residential, other types of zones. Is there anything in your research that is, that is uh, said that this will work better in certain zones than others? Yeah, I think uh, in the research that I got anyway, that uh, zoning would be uh, a better way to handle the issue or a better way to regulate it because that way they're all in one location as opposed to having to deal with neighbors who didn't want the uh, sh vacation rentals next door anyway. Um, did, were you, did you ask which places would be better? Uh, or? Which zones would be the most appropriate for uh, a VRBO? I would think ones near our touristy sites, like near like 25th Street, so that they can still participate uh, in the economy and like you know be um, incentivized to uh, you know stay locally and not just um, stay in Ogden and drive somewhere else. And that would be close to New Orleans, and the and what's going on with New Orleans's effort to regulate this industry. They're looking at a neighborhood by neighborhood approach where they would legalize. The, one neighborhood categorically prohibited and another. So uh, that we didn't get a chance to discuss that in the debate, but uh, of the major American cities, that, that would be the one that's most closely wrestling with your question. And, and with respects to whether the owner is present on the property, did, did that make a difference in, uh, in your views on? It does. The, the, once the uh, person who owns it is able to monitor it and like check up every now and then is like just not very far away or like in units that have like two separate uh, I forget what those are called but you know like two separate duplexes. like entrances yeah yeah the duplexes if like they're a, like a mother-in-law apartment type of uh, situation uh, duplex okay yeah that really helps a lot with cutting down crime and any suspicious activity I think there was uh, one story that we read of a man who would rent out his couch and so I guess he personally didn't mind being in the house with these people. Um, I think as far as the requirement, um, it would, I guess, sort of curtail like the purpose of it, you know, where people rent out their homes while they're out of town if they uh, travel a lot for their profession or something like that. I think there might be able to uh, be other ways of regulating uh, the activities there besides the actual owner themselves. Now you mentioned uh, doing background checks. Um, who does those background checks? Is that the responsibility of the property owner or is that the, the responsibility of the, the company that is the, the, the intermediary? The it depends on the company, but usually they just put a lot of responsibility of both the client who's seeking a room and also the ones who are renting that both should be doing extensive background checks um, through the city and you know, like getting their fingerprints and everything and just making sure they're real people. Um, I think like even interview processes uh, are used in a lot of cases to make sure that people are who they say they are and they seem okay and everything. Yeah, With I'll these rentals, um, you mentioned in New York City, you know, the value of $760 million revenue to the economy. How are they capturing that, tracking that revenue? You know, a hotel industry is highly regulated and they have business licenses and, you know, so it, they have to report their income. But how are these vacation rentals reporting their income so that you track that? Uh, not very well, and th so it's really an estimate of, um, like they, they looked, because in New York it's prohibited, and so they look at the Airbnb listings of all the you know places in New York and tally up how many of them. Um, I think they use a software similar to what Park City's using uh, to figure out who's paying tax revenue, 
to who's paying the taxes and who isn't. And so it's really I, an estimate, but pretty good estimate nonetheless. And didn't the New York City DA say in October that two thirds to three quarters of the short term vacation rentals in New York City were in violation of criminal yes, ordinance? You, you mentioned Park City, and that's probably the, the most uh, related situation that we'd have in Utah. Can you again review the regulations that Park City has to uh, regulate this business? What, what process do they go through? Uh, I believe it's prohibited there as well. Um, and the way, but it's enforced more locally. Um, and by using this software uh, is really where they're putting all their eggs uh, to be able to, I guess, cross-reference other databases that exist uh, that are able to pinpoint um, vac vacation rentals as per like feedback provided on the websites um, from the neighbors or things like that. Um, yeah, the, the specifics in Park City weren't very flushed out in uh, the evidence that we came across. Yeah, that, that's right, Catherine. It's a proprietary software used uh, in inter mid small to mid sized inner mountain vacation towns. Uh, I believe it was a 80 20 split on the $20,000 cost. So, of the tax money that was recovered, 20% would go to the, the software company. But uh, that is wide, uh, a widely used software. I don't, I don't remember if it was used in New York City or not, but uh, yes. Mostly in Colorado, but you don't have to be a part of the Colorado um, Ski Town Association. That's right. To use the program. Are there any other cities in Utah that are going to vacation rentals? such as Salt Lake City or some of the surrounding areas? Yeah, Moab is developing, sorry, Moab is also developing their own regulations for it as well. <coughs> St. George? Um, St. George? Uh, not, not that, that we I came read. across, we're not certain. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned was that um, Portland, the, it, it's a like 4.3 percent or something are only licensed, and is it, it's because of their licensing process, so in these other areas, like I think Denver probably, um, what makes, I mean, have they, I guess my question more is, how have they made the licensing process easier or different than Portland to get more response? Um, I know uh, s for certain that Portland has a lot more fees, you know, like filing fees, and then there have to be inspections done by uh, the city, and then you have to pay for people to come out. And so it's a lot of it is uh, very expensive with um, many different steps and uh, many different things that have to be filed. Um, and I know that Denver intentionally tried to make theirs as simple as possible, uh, where people um, only registered in, you know, they they had like a registry where people um, voluntarily put themselves on there and then other, um, I guess, pieces of information that the city would need to know were sort of like check boxed or sorry, uh, like boxes uh, that they check mark as they're filling out their um, website uh, profile. So here's a question for you. There, there's, you know, a whole group that does this couch surfing. There's a website, and that's where the owner's on site. And then there's another whole group that, you know, rents out a bedroom and they're on site versus the absentee owner. Did you get a sense, or do you have a, do you have a preference? Like, does one work better than the other, or? Um, you know, in this past summer, my younger sister was married, and I know that her uh, husband's family rented out an entire home uh, where they could all stay uh, during the week of the wedding. Um, and so I think I would preference, um, I would think it'd be also safer uh, if there was, if the house or apartment was vacant when people were going to go and stay there. And I think so if the person who owns it is on vacation or something, as long as they just like have an agent or just somebody nearby or that can just like show up on a moment's notice if there is an emergency or if there is any like calls or reports that they can go and check it out. Um, but yeah, like the couch surfing, like that's a really good way to monitoring it. Um, and I think uh, it's considered slightly different than just the other short term vacation rentals because I think the term more encompasses or at least like with Airbnb, like the sharing the renting out a room or a whole place, like the couchsurfing.com is like a separate thing that the research didn't specifically talk about as much. 
So they're separate. In, in your mind, they, you would separate those? I would, yeah, because the, I mean, initially the feel with both of them, uh, one is more professional than the other, uh, but also everything around it, you know, the issues of safety, uh, practicalness, and people generally just wanting more privacy. Yeah, we found that the, the, renter, the renters, yeah, that um, are seeking places prefer places that are private. Like the, the lowest percentage is those who have to share with strangers because I guess there's still that risk uh, from the person who is renting out their house that they could possibly be dangerous as well. Maybe the couch isn't the safest place to be. Um, but yeah, so we find like someone who's, who's like a separate party who's able to check in on that would be the most effective to preventing those crimes. In your study, yeah, we didn't mention parking in, in the regulations. Would there be regulations to the amount of parking that would be involved with the vacation? Yes, regulations like that do exist where like they are given like, you know, certain number of parking permits uh, and they can like give it out to their guest if they want. Um, but like that if they are, if they do allow for more cars to be there, then they could be punished or like fined uh, accordingly. <clears throat> Places like Park City, San Diego, um, Colorado, maybe even, even St. George, people buy those houses for that purpose. They buy a house that they're gonna use as a second home and then they'll rent it out throughout the year. I think Ogden, it would mainly be a primary residence, but was there a difference in your research between primary residence and then a second residence? Um, I did. I did find a difference. Did you? Right, and I think um, those instances are more like long-term rentals. Like if they have like a separate house that they um, leave like for the whole summer, then usually it's like a like a re like a regular lease would like long-term rentals. But it's the short-term rentals. What differentiates it is that if it's less than thirty days, which is just um, more. Actually, yeah, I'll leave it that. <laughs> And I think with your research, uh, Ms. Morales, I think you mentioned this, it's, the average is nine nights versus four nights. Yeah. Uh, yes. Six and four, right? Yeah, six and four, that if they stayed in a hotel, they would on average stay for four nights, but if it was Airbnb, then they stay six, six. nights. Six, okay. They, yeah. You stated several times that nobody uses VRBO. Where did you get those Probably statistics? Nobody uses it, but that um, it's, it's more local, and it's, so not as many uh, it's not, it doesn't have as many listings in very many cities. Because I've used VRBO. Ex yeah. How many people have stayed in a house that they've rented off of Airbnb or VR oh. VRBO? I mean, oh. I've only used VRBO. And in every instance, I've paid ta the local lodging tax oh. on it. And in every instance, I dealt directly with the homeowner. Uh. Well, within that industry, there is some competition. Uh, VRBO accuses Airbnb of being the dirty dealer that doesn't uh, exercise due diligence in collecting the taxes. Uh, and uh, with VRB, with uh, uh, Airbnb being the industry segment leader, uh, they, they sort of cast a long shadow. So uh, the students found that uh, nationwide, uh, Airbnb is, is sort of the, the primary player, but that uh, the uh, the companies like VRBO oftentimes feel that Airbnb is bringing the the industry's reputation down because they're playing fast and loose with these tax expectations. And that was something we wanted to, wanted to bring into the debate a little bit, uh, but uh, did not have as much time and opportunity to 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 talk about the 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 industry in depth as we would have liked. Yeah, I couldn't find there any problems with VBR, VB, VR, VRBO, VRBO, which is why I derailed the debate away from it. <laughs> well, and you know, a lot of it seems like it's kind of a local. Like um, we were looking for a place up in the Teton Valley, and there were infinitely more listings with VRBO than Airbnb. So it seems to be like a, in Uray, Colorado, there were a lot more options, at least for us, with VRBO versus Airbnb. Airbnb had a lot of rooms in a house where you were staying there with somebody living there. Which we didn't know more with air. Yeah, or with oh. VRBO. Oh. And we stayed longer because in some instances with the rentals than we would have stayed in a hotel because we were able to take pets. So or they have minimum stays. You know, a lot of them, it's like a minimum three night stay. So you tend to stay longer, I think. 
we didn't really touch on this during the debate, but you know, I know in some instances the tenant or the one who's renting the space, some owners have had a hard time having them leave after their time is up. <laughs> You know, and you see those kind of odd situations on the news because they'll be like, this person came to rent my house for nine days and now I can't get them out. <laughs> Landlords have that problem with renters too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read any stories like that. Yeah, we didn't come across that, but yeah. I would imagine that that would be a big problem. And I guess that determines like their lease agreements or whatever kind of, um, I don't know, maybe in those cases they would have, like, require them to sign a lease if they wanted to then become a long-term rental, but then uh, I guess they would just notify the the police if they couldn't get someone to leave. That's, and that's what's happening, yeah. But you do see those on the news every once in a while. You know, I was intrigued by your argument that you said if it's, if it's completely restricted, that it just drives it underground. Um, how, how do they, I, I just don't get how they could be underground and do it be successful at, at renting their their unit um, I think if it if it were successful it would have to be uh, some sort of website or um, I guess that's what it would be that was constantly evolving um, you know for me what comes to mind is uh, the Silk Road you know I compared it to people buying drugs illegally over the internet and the Silk Road was a pretty uh, big industry, um, but the way that that had been handled is by constantly going after it even when it reappeared. And so I think because there is a lot of money on the table, and there are a lot of people who are desperate uh, for money who would, you know, put up their houses, even if it was illegal, to be able to make ends meet. And so I think as long as there is a need, people will always be doing it. Probably not as much, um, but I think that's how it would be handled, you know, is by just having to constantly figure out their new tricks and they would be developing new tricks and yeah, just the back or and even forth. even by like word of mouth as well. Like if, you know, you would contact people like, hey, is there any place that I could, you know, stay in the city? And they could, so it, it could just like transfer over the phone um, instead of being all on the internet, which would be mm -hmm. harder another, to regulate. Another thing that I thought was, that maybe was enlightening to me is people that, uh, um, will list their house, won't list it necessarily all the time. It will, they'll just be, oh, I'm going to go on a two-week vacation, so I'll put it, I'll list it for that time. How much of that happens versus people that just buy the house for that purpose? Could you tell? Is there a way to, to know that? I don't think so, but, but, you're, but you're right where the available listings aren't available all the time. So yes, yeah, so that could be another way that they would dodge um, Regulations, if it was prohibited. Well, you know, in, in Ogden, I, I guess we're looking at it as though it's it's a, it's a house that's available all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, then we're looking at you know at distance separation. How many can you have on a block, or how you know? Uh, but if they're if they're moving around like that, I mean, if that's going to make that kind of a thing a little harder. The ones I've stayed out, a lot of them, it's private property owner. There, it's directly from the homeowners, and they rent it when they're not. You know, it's a vacation home. Like one of them, uh, he was a professor at the university in Laramie. They had a, a home in Teton Valley, uh, just you know, over the border in Idaho, and they stayed there over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, but during the off season, or when they weren't there. For a ski vacation or whatever, it was available as a rental. Yeah, I think you know what Councilmember Blair was talking about in St. George. People that buy it as a summer home—that's that, I expect what most of them are. And you know, I've stayed in those before, and they're, you know, they're they're really nice to be able to go and stay in somebody's house. They even, uh, well, this one that we stayed in on Avalon on Catalina Island, that little. Uh, a search thing through the house, a little deal, that, and then in the book you could write everything down. It was, it was just kind of a, a, a nice experience. The thing about an Avalon, though, is, is we had a, 10 of us that stayed there, and none of us drove a car because it's an island. It made it a lot nicer. Here in Ogden, you know, you've got 10 people and potentially 10 cars. Maybe not, though. I mean, Maybe like, not. I mean, you know, we've the place we stayed at the Tetons, we had a fair number of people, but we rode in, yeah. you know, four people per vehicle. Yeah. So it yeah. was well, two cars. Well, I was say potentially 10 yeah. cars. It's just. Can you just clarify for me um, the rent control eviction? I, I kind of got two, two um, 
issues going. One, you talked about the Ellis Act, which I'm assuming is in California. So are they taking rent control um, um, and evicting actually the renters that are in there now to do that so that they can charge more? Right, like they're saying like, oh, we're going out of business or oh, we're closing down. And so then they leave and then they reopen their building for just short. And then the other one was you talked about um, somebody that's already leasing their space and they're leaving and then they're getting more for the rent, it, it, kind of almost a sublease kind of thing. Is, did I hear that right as well? Okay. Yeah, so it would be maybe someone renting out an apartment uh, from their landlord and then when they leave town, they would rent this out to a stranger but not inform their landlord. So two different issues. Okay. And that could be a violation of a lease. Yeah, okay. I just did, I, I, I kind of heard them as together but it, it sounded like, yeah. yes. Yeah. I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Better that statistic events. you gave with, you know, this, are they rented out? I mean, 59 days a year, is that what I heard you say? Or did I hear it wrong? Oh, yes, yeah. I, I think that statistic was for the people who live in the homes. Oh, I um, see. Yeah, rather than having the home designated to be oh, rented okay. out. Okay, I was going to say, can you make more money on 59 days <laughs> than you could on renting it out full time? <laughs> that didn't seem reasonable. But. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I think uh, also when you talked about the hotel, uh, it's important to make it as level a playing field as possible. Do you have any other suggestions along these lines of how you could make the rentals and the hotels on the same plane aspect? Same playing in terms of pricing or? Well, as being uh, competitive equally. So if if a hotel has to pay taxes, then these individuals has to pay taxes. If they charge a certain price, there there has to be a, a level of, of a playing field for both the hotels and the uh, rentals. Otherwise, uh, one of them is going to go out of business. Yeah. I, and in terms of taxing, there is. But I think that uh, there will always be a market for both, just depending on like what people want. Like There's things that hotels can provide that the short-term vacation rentals won't. And so it's so that's why the prices would vary. But um, we so like Bianca said, that because there are more short-term vacation rentals in some places, the rates of hotels have gone down so that um, it does make it more competitive, which encourages probably you know better pricing, better practices. Uh, if that's what you mean by level playing field. Well, I was thinking also you could uh, restrict how many rentals you would have in an area to uh, compensate for that uh, aspect there. The number of hotels you're going to have too. Well, I'm not. Sh I'm not saying that, but I'm. I'm just saying that if there needs to be a one, level uh, uh, field here, and you know that would be possibly one aspect of looking at restrictions of how many would be operating. Yeah, same with um, with the zoning concern as well. I think that would be able to take care of that as well. Yeah, I I think it's a I think it's a competitive market with hotels, uh, but I wouldn't consider it a threatening market because I think there is still a large um, demographic of people that wouldn't want to rent out of Airbnb. They would much rather prefer a hotel, and I think it just caters to do to two different types of. Uh, customers who have different needs. And so while some may leave one for the other, I don't think that all will disappear. Yes, disappear. Any, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your good work on this. Mr. Chair, might, might you uh, describe the process that uh, the Planning Commission and then the Council will be considering this? I don't know, Glenn, do we know a schedule? We don't know a schedule yet, sorry. Um, well, as far as I, as far as I know, uh, tomorrow, uh, that's why many of our planning commissioners are here, they will be reviewing this. They, they reviewed it a couple of months ago, I believe, wasn't it? And tabled it. Um, and uh, so that's why they're here. They're using your research to help them decide tomorrow what their recommendation will be to the city council. Um, then I suppose there will be um, more work sessions and, and at some point we'll have to legislate this and, and make an ordinance that, that uh, fits. Um, what, in this legislation process, however, um, we, we don't usually end up on one of the extremes. We usually kind of find the compromises and, 
you know, to the mitigating factors that will help it help it succeed and and not uh, damage other areas. And so that's kind of what we're looking at it from is those in through those eyes. So I'm not sure if that's what you wanted or I'd be happy to keep you posted. Balancing private property. Right yeah, balancing right. all the rights of everyone that there, there will be opportunities for public input. All any of you could come and for the Planning Commission or with the Council to give your input on the issue if you'd like. You could come tomorrow. Um, I think it's on your agenda at 6.30, I believe, isn't it? Something like that. So, what pardon? time? I, I looked on, on your agenda and I, it looks like it's about 6.30 tomorrow. It, it, should be, it should be heard. So if you'd like to come back and, and uh, give your point of view, that would be welcome then. All right. Your information Thank you. was very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Very yeah. Well Good. Well done. Thank you. Anything else for? No. So thank you. Well, we, thank you very much. We're going to continue the work session, but we'll be in the other room. Yep. So. We will be adjourning to the other room for the rest of our work session. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.